Chapter 3 Who Moved the Stone at the Tomb Denied the power of the vote, Caiaphas lost no time in contacting Pilate, fully prepared to play his ace with the pressure of blackmail if Pilate hesitated to institute the charge of treason against Jesus. Under Roman law, treason was a capital offense which, if proven, was punishable by death. Only the Roman procurator could try such a case, and only he could legally impose the death penalty. This Caiaphas demanded, and silence was his price. The high priest possessed positive knowledge that Pontius Pilate had been an active party to a secret, futile plot to assassinate Tiberius Caesar. Citation Carlo Franzen Memoirs of Pontius Pilate Armed with this knowledge, Caiaphas imposed his will on the procurator, who trembled with fear of exposure, disgrace, and the threat to his life. It is with certainty we can assume that Joseph pleaded with Pilate not to interfere in a new trial of Jesus. Joseph was unaware of the deadly secret Caiaphas held over the Spanish-born procurator. Neither his pleadings nor his influence could prevail nor could the earnest supplication of Pilate's wife avail, who, disturbed by the potency of a dream the night before, begged of him to have nothing to do with the trial of, quote, that just man, unquote. Pilate deferred to his wife. He owed his exalted position to the social eminence his marriage had brought. His wife was Claudia Proculia, the illegitimate daughter of Claudia, the third wife of Tiberius Caesar, and granddaughter of Augustus Caesar. Pilate knew that the emperor against whom he had plotted was very fond of his stepdaughter, and being an astute politician, Pontius Pilate deferred to her every whim. For him to deny Claudia's urgent request is but to prove how serious Pilate considered the hold Caiaphas had on him. At heart, Pilate was not in sympathy with the demands of the Sadducees. He found no foundation to their charges. Four times Jesus was pronounced innocent, but Pilate, in his evasive gesture of calling for a bowl of water to signify he washed his hands of the whole matter, acceded to the murderous demands of the Sanhedrin. Nevertheless, he permitted the Roman guard to carry out the tragic act historically known as the Scandal of the Cross. The dream that tortured Pilate's wife on the previous night foretold disaster to him if he judged Jesus. The dream came true. Later, Pontius Pilate committed suicide. Citation C.F. Eusebius From the beginning to the end, the arrest and dual trial was a vicious frame-up, a betrayal, a travesty of justice. From that dark hour in the garden to the crucifixion, the plot was hurried to its conclusion. It had to be. The murmurings of the people had been growing louder as evidenced at the final trial. Following the fatal verdict, the whole city seethed with fear and unrest. Caiaphas and his fanatical collaborators had triumphed, but the Romans held the lash and would not hesitate to use it, unmercifully on the slightest provocation or interference. So greatly did terror prevail throughout Jerusalem that all known to have been associated with Jesus in even the slightest way fled into hiding. Nine of the twelve disciples had fled the city directly after the arrest in the garden, leaving only three standing by. Judas was no longer numbered among the faithful. Only Peter, John, and Nicodemus remained. Even though Peter had denied his master, he, with the beloved disciple John, had followed Jesus into the crowded courtroom of the Sanhedrin. There, for the third time, Peter denied association with his Lord. After the fatal circumstances had arisen, Peter, overwhelmed with self-torment and ashamed of his denials, despondently went into seclusion within the city. He did not witness the crucifixion. Of those present, the scriptures refer by name only to John and Mary, the mother of Jesus, witnessing the tragedy at the foot of the cross, and the three women, Mary Magdalene, Mary the wife of Cleophas, and Salome, who watched from a respectful distance. Citation, quote, But all those who were the acquaintance of Christ stood at a distance, as did the women who had followed Jesus from Galilee, observing all these things. Nicodemus 8.11 Wonderment is often evinced at the omission of the Bethany sisters, Martha and Mary, whom Jesus loved. The impression gathered is that they were not present. This does not seem conceivable. The name of Joseph is not mentioned, but it seems safe to say they were all present. 
The record says, quote, All the women who followed him and others were mingled among the crowd. The speed with which Joseph called on Pilate after the demise indicates that he was present. Pilate appears to be surprised at hearing the swift news, asking those near him if it was true Jesus was dead. It is doubtful if the beloved John and blessed Mary witnessed the expiration on the cross. We are told that after Jesus committed his mother to the care of John, the disciple led her away to spare her the last dark hours of suffering. Probably the average Christian of today fails to realize the extent of the physical and mental torture borne by the sensitive Jesus through this agonizing period. From the hour of his last supper to the time of his death, he had not touched food or drink. He had been third degreed from the moment he stood in the torchlit Sanhedrin until after his trial before Pilate, then followed the heckling, the crowning of thorns, and the reviling by his enemies, who had placed the mocking sign on him, King of the Jews. Following his condemnation to death, he had been brutally flogged by his Roman executioners, his back slashed to ribbons. Even today it is conceded that the Roman flogging was the most cruel ever to be inflicted on a human being. This we can well believe as we scan the Roman records which attest to the fact that only one out of ten ever survived the ghastly scourging. His suffering intensified when the reviling Roman soldiers pressed the bitter sponge of hyssop to his parched lips when he called for water as he hung on the cross. All this he endured apart from the terrible torment he suffered as he slowly expired on the cross. Weighing all this as we must, we are not left in doubt that Jesus was as physically superb as he was mentally and spiritually. According to both Jewish and Roman law, unless the body of an executed criminal be immediately claimed by the next of kin, the body of the victim was cast into a common pit with others, where all physical record of them was completely obliterated. Why did not Mary, the mother of Jesus, as the immediate next of kin, claim the body of her beloved son? Perhaps John, fearing for the safety of Mary, restrained her, leaving it to Joseph, the family guardian, to make the request. We do know that Joseph was the one who personally went to Pilate and obtained the procurator's official sanction to claim the body, remove it from the cross, and prepare it for burial in his private sepulchre, which was within the garden of his estate. You will likely agree that this was in order, but consider the circumstances. A reign of terror continued to prevail within the city of Jerusalem. No follower of Christ was safe from the evil machinations of the Sanhedrin, who were then enjoying a Roman holiday in the persecution of the followers of, quote, the way, end quote. As already stated, all but two of the disciples had fled the city and gone into safe seclusion in fear of their lives. However, there was yet another, Nicodemus, who had not fled the city. But Joseph, the Roman senator and the legislative member of the Sanhedrin, also a disciple, was the only close associate of Christ who dared to walk openly on the street without fear of molestation. Was he too powerful and prominent for either side to harm? Yet Joseph knew he was dealing with dynamite, and from the circumstances that followed, it appears that Joseph did fear interference, not personally, but in his intentions. Actually, why did he go to Pontius Pilate? Why did he not claim the body in the ordinary way according to custom? Certainly it was not a common occurrence to seek permission from the highest authority in the land in order to obtain the body of an executed criminal. Why had he not sought permission from the Sanhedrin? They were inflexible in their rule that a body must be claimed and buried before sunset. Actually, under normal circumstances, there was no need to go further than the Sanhedrin. Jesus was regarded as a Jew. Joseph was a Jew and a high-ranking member of the Jewish Sanhedrin. There was only one reason why Joseph preferred to make the claim for the body to Pilate. He knew that the fanatical Sadducean priesthood sought the total extinction of Jesus, even in death. Annas and Caiaphas had succeeded in their diabolical, murderous scheme of having Jesus crucified as a common criminal. Does it not stand to reason that they would seek to carry out the ignominy to its fullest extent? Would they not have preferred that the body of Jesus be disposed of in the common criminal pit so that his extinction would be total and all memory steeped in shame? Certainly it would have been to the best interest of the Sanhedrin. To have Jesus decently interred within a respectably known sepulchre was but to erect a martyr's tomb for the multitude to flock to in an ageless pilgrimage. That would have doomed the Sanhedrin more surely than anything else. Therefore, reason would indicate that the high priesthood were bent on interfering with the claim of the kin of the crucified Christ. 
With Mary, the Sanhedrin could interfere, but not with Joseph. He did not fear them and was determined to thwart them in their designs. The scripture says he went, quote, boldly, unquote, before Pilate and successfully asserted the kin rights of his niece. Between Caiaphas and Pilate, there still existed an armed truce, but the latter played a skillful game. He played both sides to his own advantage. Pilate had already satisfied the Sanhedrin. No matter how they opposed him thereafter, at the moment they could not deny him the right of fulfilling this particular part of the law to which both the Jew and the Roman subscribed in the disposal of the body. Pilate needed Joseph's friendship, and there was no easier way of securing it than by recognizing Joseph's claim to the murdered body of his favorite nephew. By this act of interference, Joseph became a doubly marked man by the high priesthood of Jewry. Returning from his mission with Pilate, Joseph's acts are again shown to be hurried as though fearing interception. He returned to the scene of the tragedy followed by Nicodemus, who carried 100 pounds of mixed spices with which to prepare the body prior to burial. Premature darkness had set in following the phenomenal storm that broke loose upon the land as Jesus expired on the cross. Rending in twain the curtain in the temple and scattering the spectators abroad, only two remained. Mary Magdalene and the wife of Cleophas, sister of the Blessed Mary. They watched as Joseph, with the help of Nicodemus, lowered the body from the cross, laid it on the ground, and wrapped the mortal remains of Jesus in the burial linen which Joseph had personally provided. It was dark, and time appeared precious. Again, we are impressed with the evidence of hurriedness. Without any further preparation, they carried the body to the sepulchre in the garden of Joseph and laid it within the tomb, while the two women who had followed watched nearby. Joseph and Nicodemus had too little time to properly anoint the body and dress it according to the custom in the linen shroud. Yet the surprising thing is that they sealed the entrance to the tomb with a, quote, great, unquote, stone. Why? Did Joseph have other intentions? Common sense alone tells us that Joseph would not have allowed the body of his beloved nephew to remain in the ghastly state it was when lowered from the cross, bloody, sweaty, grimy, and torn. Then what happened in between the few dark hours from the time the sealing stone was rolled to close the entrance to the tomb and early dawn on the third day, when the second great drama took place, the disappearance of the body of Jesus from the sepulchre? We Christians accept without any reservations the biblical version of the disappearance, but it should be remembered that in those days there was no biblical version to go by, and Jesus was but barely known outside his native land. Not then was he the accepted Messiah. Therefore, as we keep this in mind, we can better understand the impact pro and con this startling incident created among the populace, friend and foe. The discovery was made on the Sabbath dawn when Mary Magdalene, Mary, the mother of James, and Salome appeared on the scene at the break of day, bringing with them spices with which to clean and anoint the body of Christ. Their intentions are evident. They knew the body had been hastily interred without the proper burial preparation. The two Marys had been witness to this. They had watched Joseph and Nicodemus take the body from the cross and hurriedly wrap it in the linens at the foot of the cross. They had followed the two men into the garden of Joseph, standing nearby, as the body was placed on the ledge within the tomb, and witnessed the sealing of the entrance to the tomb with the quote, great, unquote, stone. They were not likely to anoint the body twice within a few hours. On approaching the tomb, the scriptural record tells us that the first experience of the three women was one of shock. They saw that the great stone was completely removed from the entrance. This shock was followed by another as the drama unfolded. To their astonishment, they saw a young man dressed in white, seated in an unconcerned manner on the very ledge within the tomb on which the body of Christ had been laid. From a study of the Markan manuscript, which relates the story with vivid realism, all evidence tends to prove that this particular young man was a complete stranger to the women, and his attitude towards them was calm and unperturbed. He did not rush out to meet them excitedly. Before they had time to speak, he told them Jesus was not there the body was gone. They must go to Galilee, where he would meet them. He told the stunned women the facts in the simple manner of one relating an incident he believed they should have known, but they did not know. Neither did they know the stranger within the tomb. All they were conscious of was that the body of their Lord was gone. 
Without questioning the stranger, the frightened women hastened back to the city, with Mary Magdalene, the youngest and most active of the three women, hurrying in advance to inform Peter and John of the startling news. Evidently, the two disciples were just as ignorant and bewildered over the disappearance of the body, if not doubtful. We find them hastening to the tomb and, on arriving, investigating the interior. On entering the sepulchre, John stooped to pick up the discarded linen that lay collapsed, but intact, supported only by the spices. But where was the young stranger in white? He was not there for the two disciples to interrogate. Who was he? What was he doing there? Where had he gone? What did he know? Why was he never found? History would give a great deal to know the answers to these puzzling questions. The records are silent. Following the entombment, the Sadducees, suspicious of the disciples, determined to prevent any possible tampering with the body. They requested Pilate to post a guard over the tomb, reminding him that Jesus had claimed that on the third day he would rise from the dead. They did not believe this and instead considered it a ruse of the disciples to steal the body. Pilate flatly refused. He had already washed his hands of the matter and told them to arrange their own guard, which they did. In this case, where was the guard? The tomb was unguarded when the three women had arrived. Why had the guard left so early, and where was the change of guards? Surely the Sanhedrin, who had assumed full responsibility for posting the guard, would have taken every possible precaution. It was in their best interest to do so. To do otherwise was to invite the roused anger of the populace and of Pilate. They dare not have placed themselves in such an uncompromising position. We can well believe that the Sadducees had nothing to do with the disappearance of the body. If they had caused the body to be removed, they would never have unwrapped it, leaving the linen there. Neither would they have left the entrance to the tomb open. In their position there was no need for haste. The guard was theirs. Certainly they would have concealed their crime by replacing the stone at the entrance, giving orders to the guard forbidding anyone entry. Again, everything points to haste. Much has been said, pro and con, in reference to the story of the guards, with the general assumption being that it was not true, but a whitewashed alibi of the Sanhedrin. Common opinion is that even if the guard had fallen asleep at their post, a stone so large and heavy that sealed the tomb could never have been moved away without awakening them. If they had fallen asleep at their post of duty, they would have been punished by death, as was the military custom of that time. In this, general opinion errs. It is generally assumed that the guard had to be Roman. If it were true, the Roman penalty for dereliction of duty would undoubtedly have been imposed, but the guard belonged to the priestly Sanhedrin, whose discipline did not include the death penalty. The story given by the priest's guards is most probable. They admitted they had fallen asleep and, on awakening, were surprised to see that the huge stone had been rolled away. On further investigation, they saw that the tomb was empty and straightaway hurried to the Sanhedrin with the news. Caiaphas bribed them, giving them money to say that the disciples had stolen the body and to leave it to him to convince Pilate that such was the case. Nevertheless, they were deeply concerned over the disappearance, and the Jewish record informs us that Caiaphas ordered Joseph to appear before the Sanhedrin for questioning. Another stormy scene occurred before the assembly. Caiaphas openly accused Joseph of being the prime instigator of the plot and demanded to know where the body reposed. To all their questioning, Joseph maintained a stony silence. He refused to talk, defiant in the knowledge that he was beyond their power to prosecute. Why did they not interrogate Mary, the mother of Jesus, or Peter, John, or Nicodemus, whom the Sanhedrin knew were the only associates of Christ present in the city at that time? Perhaps the Sanhedrin considered such simple people as they incapable of carrying out such a delicate operation. Perhaps the genuine agitation of the disciples, and of the women concerning the mystery, was enough to satisfy the priesthood that they had no knowledge of what had happened. The difference between the members of the Sanhedrin and the disciples was, the Jewish priests insisted that the body of Jesus was stolen and secretly buried by Joseph or the disciples. The latter believed Christ had risen according to his word on the third day, to be the first fruits of all who slept. Therefore, it matters not who moved the stone at the tomb. Sorrow turned into triumph and an unquenchable zeal to preach the gospel to all the world. Joseph of Arimathea, the uncle of Jesus, was no longer guardian over his corporeal existence, but over a greater treasure, Christ's sacred mission on earth. 
Henceforth, he was to be the guardian of all the beloved against the arch enemy and ultimately their leader. He began to dedicate himself to his amazing destiny, which later was to make it possible for Peter and Paul to accomplish their great work in the service of the Lord. Joseph himself was to plant the roots of Christianity in fertile soil where it would flourish and never perish from off the earth.